Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. We are delighted to be co-hosting this event with the American Chamber of Commerce in Japan. My name is Kelsey De Rinaldis. I'm an Assistant Cultural Affairs Officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that today's event is on the record and will be recorded. Following the opening remarks and the presentation by our keynote speaker, Daniel Castro, we will open the session for question and answers. We invite you to submit your questions throughout the session in the Q&A box you'll see on your screen. We will take questions from there and you may submit them anonymously. Additionally, throughout today's program, we will be conducting audience polling. We encourage you to participate. It is also anonymous. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Melinda Pavek, who is the Science, Innovation and Development Director from the Economic Section here at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. Melinda, over to you. Thank you, Kelsey. Good morning from Tokyo. On behalf of the U.S. Embassy, I would like to welcome our webinar guests for what is sure to be a fascinating discussion with Daniel Castro from the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. My name is Melinda Pavic, and I am the Director for Science, Innovation, and Development at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo. My team works with government, academic, and scientific organizations on science and technology policy, as well as on research and development collaboration. I'd like to offer some context for today's discussion by highlighting our work on technology issues. First, I should mention that the flagship U.S.-Japan Digital Trade Agreement entered into force on January 1st this year. The United States and Japan have a $40 billion digital trade relationship. This agreement's high standard provisions provide a strong foundation for continuing to support and boost our digital economies. On the policy front, Japan and the United States are very closely aligned on internet and cyber policy issues. We are both committed to a free and open internet, we both support multi-stakeholder approaches to internet governance. We both champion the free flow of data across borders and oppose data localization. And we both promote the need for interoperable frameworks for the protection and use of personal data. While there is work to be done in all these areas, we see that the US-Japan agreement on these core principles has made a positive, positive difference both bilaterally and within international organizations, such as the OECD, the G20, and the APEC Forum. In fact, it was within these international organizations that good progress was made on how we approach artificial intelligence. The US and Japan worked together in the OECD with other countries to produce the first set of intergovernmental principles on AI. These were presented in early 2019 and underscore our common values for the practical impl implementation of responsible artificial intelligence. In June of 2019, under Japan's G20 presidency, the G20 adopted human-centered AI principles that drew from work done on the OECD AI principles. And now, one year later, the United States and Japan, along with 13 other economies, have launched the Global Partnership on AI, or GPI, which is a voluntary multi-stakeholder initiative to encourage the responsible adoption of AI. GPI will have an in initial focus on responding to and recovering from COVID-19. I could go on about the many positive outcomes that have resulted from U.S.-Japan collaboration and partnership on technology, but we are all eager to hear Daniel's insights and expertise, so I will stop here. Thank you again for joining this webinar. Daniel, a big thank you to you for staying up late to share your perspectives on the impact of emerging technologies and data innovation. I am looking forward to an excellent presentation and the questions to follow. Kelsey, back to you. Thank you, Melinda. Now I would like to introduce Yoshitaka Sugihara, the ACCJ Vice President and Co-Chair of the Digital Economy Committee. Sugihara-san, dozo. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Kelsey, and thank you, Miranda, for your remarks. The ACCJ is very happy to partner with the Embassy on this event with Mr. Castello, and thank you for inviting ACCJ members to this event. 
The digital economy and the implementation of digital to every industry is a challenge, especially on this corona period. People and industry have been forced to accept new technologies on these new situations. Uh, given the cross-cutting nature of digital economy and how emerging technologies and the security issues affect many of our businesses, the topics Mr. Castro will be presenting on are of top of mind concerns and ones in which we should all be aware of. It is also important to the US-Japan economic and trade relationship. We are expecting 11th US-Japan Internet Economy Dialogue this coming September. One of the main topics is how two countries collaborate to proceed to adapt new technologies through democratic processes. Uh, we have to push innovations, but we have to respect our common values. AI is obviously the main focus. Uh, well, on behalf of the ACCJ, thank you, Mr. Castro, for presenting to many ACCJ members uh, participating today. I know I am looking forward to hearing your presentations. With that, I will pass the virtual floor back to Kelsey to continue today's event. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sugihara-san. So before we turn it over to our keynote speaker today, I would like to open our first audience poll. You will see it pop up on your screen in just a few moments. Please do participate as it will give us and Daniel an idea of who is in the audience today. Again, as a reminder, these polls are anonymous, so please do join us in participating. So while you are taking the poll, I will introduce our keynote speaker, Daniel Castro. Joining us from Washington, DC, Daniel is the Vice President at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation and Director of the Foundation's Center for Data Innovation. He publishes and is frequently featured in media on a wide variety of issues related to information technology and internet policy. We are so pleased he is able to join us here today. Wonderful. I will give a few more moments here and then we'll share the polling results, Daniel, before you begin so you can have an understanding of who is joining us here in the audience today. All right, now everyone can see our poll to see how your organizations are engaging in the AI economy. Wonderful. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Daniel. Great, uh, Kelsey, thank you so much. Um, and I should have my screen um, up for everyone right now as well. Um, first of all, uh, I appreciate the invitation to um, talk with you this morning. Um, thank you, Suge uh, Harisan, for uh, the warm welcome and introduction. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about enabling the um, AI economy, artificial intelligence economy. So I work for a think tank, um, as Kelsey mentioned, uh, that's really focused on the intersection of technology, innovation, and public policy. And as we emerge from a global pandemic, you know, it's clearer now than ever before that digital innovation um, is a key driver of economic growth and one that policymakers need to be focused on. So so the challenge for so many different governments around the world is how do we actually enable the digital economy to flourish, to promote innovation, to increase trade, and to generate higher paying jobs over the next decade? And, and you know, I want to start with this slide. Um, it's about the pacing problem. So this is where policy starts to get tricky because the digital economy is always changing and these changes occur very rapidly. Um, what this means in practice is that we see things like Moore's Law, which drives rapid technological change. But then when we look at the social and political systems, these move much slower. And so that's, that's the pacing problem. The idea that tech innovation um, increasingly outpaces the ability of laws and regulations to keep up. Now, you know, the reason this is, you know, so important now, we've seen this problem in the past. But right now, when you look at the screen, you can see that the rate of technological change is faster now than it has been in the past. When you look at the rate of adoption of new technologies, the adoption life cycles 
are much more compressed. And so what this means is that you know, policymakers, the legislators and regulators um, must be even more responsive than in the past. So to understand where we are today, it helps understand where we've come from. Um, you know, if you look at the, at the past 50 years, you'll see that we've had uh, multiple waves of digital innovation. In the 1960s, we had the mainframe economy. This is where you had companies like IBM um, rise up and, and really the companies that were most competitive were those that were figuring out how do we make use of this new technology, the mainframe. Then we moved into the network economy, 70s and 80s, you had the personal computer, local area networks, and this is where companies like Microsoft, Otis, and HP became very dominant. And these were the companies that were dominant, but then the ones that succeeded in this economy and the network economy were those businesses that figured out how do we harness this new capability of having word processors at the desk of, of every employee. Then we moved into the internet economy in the 90s and, and early 2000s, um, the web 1.0, this is the rise of the dot coms, uh, Amazon, Google's, Yahoo. Um, and then more recently, we've been moving into the data economy. So this was, you know, social, mobile, analytics, and cloud. And most recently, we've started emerging into this algorithmic economy or AI economy, where we're really looking at technologies that enable automation through algorithms. So artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, blockchain, all of these are, are the core technologies that are driving these changes. Now, the reason we see this change of these past two areas, the data economy and this emerging algorithmic economy, is principally because of data. We have better data, it's more precise, it's more accurate, higher resolution, and, and more timely. And all this data provides two main benefits. One, better data means better decisions. Um, and this is what we're seeing with data analytics. But also with better data, we're seeing more automation. And that's the part where it's Internet of Things and artificial intelligence that's leading to new competitive benefits. So in economic terms, what this is really about, of course, is increasing productivity. But we're also talking about so many social benefits, like improving public safety, increasing environmental sustainability, improving healthcare, and creating more effective governments. One of the reasons that we're seeing AI driving this change is because AI is increasingly better at humans at many different tasks. Uh, pretty much every week we see a new task that's added to this list. AI is better right now than humans at playing various games like chess and poker, uh, detecting various medical conditions. So it's better than a doctor that has eight years of trained experience. Um, it's better at things like transcribing speech or, or doing lip reading and even very, you know, uh, technical tasks like inspecting bridges or engaging in different types of construction. And so as AI and data become more prevalent, we're seeing this transformation in many different parts of the economy. So we're seeing data transforming homes with you know, new devices and applications like smart locks, smart meters, smart lights, smart doorbells, all of these new connected devices that are in the home. We're seeing this transform cities um, with technologies like uh, that are transforming transit, waste, water, air quality, lighting, safety, um, all of these different connected technologies um, combined with mobile technologies are enabling these types of, of new opportunities. We're seeing data transform uh, directly people themselves. So we see everything from baby monitors to, uh, you know, all the different wearables, especially in the fitness industry and, and health. And finally, you know, we're seeing data being used to transform entirely um, uh, entire industries, whether it's healthcare, agriculture, um, mining, manufacturing, across the board, we're seeing industries being rebuilt. And lastly, we're seeing a data transform government itself. And so, you know, we've seen technology, we've seen e-government uh, being used for many years, but with the latest technology, with data, we're seeing it being used in very unique ways. So you can kind of trace the transformation of um, these different waves of innovation by looking at how government itself has changed recently. If you think about kind of the early internet era, what government was mainly doing, it was mainly using technology to, be, to provide more information to the public. Um, and then, you know, the next stage was about two-way communication, the interactive stage. You got to transactional, this is where government started to build apps. 
And now we're moving into this new realm of government that's perceptive, where the work involved in interacting with government can be significantly reduced and automated for all parties, both businesses, citizens, and government agencies themselves. So if you think about a, a kind of typical um, interaction that somebody might have with the government, it might be something like getting a new passport. Um, in the informational stage, this would be inf you know, the question of, can you find out what are the hours for the passport office? In the interactive stage, it might have been, you could email the passport office and ask them some questions. In the transactional stage, which is where we are more or less today, you, know, you might use an app to renew your passport online or, or use some kind of web form. But if we move into this perceptive phase, the idea there is that you can really um, reduce the burden on everyone. So instead of having to go to an app or instead of emailing somebody, you just say something like, Alexa, renew my passport. And government has its own bots that are interfacing with your own bot that has access to all the information that it needs to complete this transaction on your behalf. And really the workload diminishes. And that's the type of transformation that we want to see in government and we also want to see uh, throughout many different sectors. Now, one of the most important things when we talk about innovation, of course, is that innovation isn't just about product innovation. There's innovation that basically um, every step of the business models that exist, it can be around processes. You know, can you use a superior method to do work? It can be around performance. You know, can you create a distinguishing feature of functionality for a different service or product? Um, you can look at things like, uh, you know, the channel. Can you find new ways to offer uh, value to customers and users? You can innovate around brand. You can innovate around customer engagement. And we're seeing data being used in all of these spaces, not just kind of on the, the latest shiny object. Now, the conventional wisdom when we talk about digital innovation is sometimes um, kind of following along with this quote that I have up here from Klaus Schwab, who wrote The Fourth Industrial Revolution. He said, simply put, major technological innovations are on the brink of fueling momentous change throughout the world, inevitably so. And so this is really this, this very optimistic view that we can kind of sit back and wait for innovation to happen, um, that we don't really have to worry about this. Uh, but as somebody that works in this space, I can tell you that the pace of digital disruption varies widely by industry. Um, and you can see in this chart that digital disruption uh, significantly lags in some sectors. And so one of the key questions here is why did this occur in certain sectors and, and why doesn't it occur in others? And how can we mitigate this? Because this is one of the key economic challenges that policymakers need to address if they want to leverage the benefits of digital innovation. So if we're talking at the national level, there's really three areas that are the key drivers of national level digital transformation. It's technology, so you know, what do you have? What do you have available in terms of access and adoption of technologies like broadband and government, various emerging technologies, whether it's blockchain, drones, um, all of these platform technologies. Then there's the question of the people, you know, and, and what do you want to do with the technology? Those are the people that are answering those questions. And this is where policies around STEM education, entrepreneurship, investment R&D play a huge role. And then there's the regulatory environment. It's the question of what are you allowed to do with this new digital technology or innovations that you have. And here's where we see policies around data protection law, antitrust, and many other um, issues come into play. And so the key lesson for policymakers, of course, is the policy affects all of these, not just the regulatory uh, environment, but also what technology is available and what type of entrepreneurship um, what type of educational environment exists in the countries. And so when you start thinking about those different policies, you can start thinking about the elements that should be going into a national digital strategy. You can talk about funding and creating pilot projects and investing in R&D and, and various technologies. You can think about the government's role in, in planning and building public-private partnerships and creating industry-led standards. You can think about government agencies themselves spurring adoption of, of different technologies and making more data available for industry to innovate. You can think about the, the regulatory environment, the regulations that could be put in place uh, to minimize the cost of collecting and using data, to fast track new uses of AI um, and new uses of smart devices. And then of course, there's also trade policy. How do we think about the flow of data between nations and how do we promote access to the, the best in class technology all around the world? 
And in particular, a lot of countries have taken this model and they're applying it to artificial intelligence. And they're thinking about, you know, they're looking back at the internet economy and they're seeing that the countries that were most successful in this space have benefited tremendously. And they're recognizing that AI is one of these same technologies that is gonna have a tremendous impact across the entire economy. And so they're saying, we want to be doing very well in this space as well. And so they're pursuing AI policies. And what we're seeing is that these policies uh, look very different in various uh, countries. We did a report last year, who's winning the AI race, um, where we look principally at China, the EU, and the United States. Uh, this report's available on our website, datainnovation.org for free, if anyone's interested in, in going through some of the details we found. And we're actually updating it this year uh, with some new information. But one of the most important findings um, we had from that report, aside from the question of kind of who's in the lead, is the types of approaches that different countries are taking to this question of digital transformation. And what we're seeing is there's two general types of responses. One response to digital transformation is the precautionary principle. The precautionary principle says government should limit the use of new technology until it's proven safe. The idea here is that it's basically better to be safe than sorry. And the clearest example of this type of policy is when there's concern about new technology and then government simply bans that, whether it's ride sharing, e-scooters, facial recognition, or, or something else. In contrast, there's the innovation principle. The innovation principle says that the vast majority of new innovations are generally beneficial and pose little risk. The government's role should be to encourage them. Now, the innovation principle isn't saying that uh, the market will always get things right the first time. It also doesn't mean the government shouldn't intervene, but it does mean that it's often beneficial to take a wait and see approach. You know, how will markets, platforms, and consumers respond to different problems that arise? What are the potential unintended consequences of early regulatory solutions? And are there alternatives to these types of interventions? And these two approaches, they're very different worldviews. In the former, government's role is really to serve as a roadblock to keep consumers safe. In the latter, government is acting as a, a guardrail to keep consumers safe, but saying we wanna see the innovations come sooner and faster. So we're gonna pause here and we're gonna do a poll and then I'm gonna come back to the rest of the presentation. So the question up here is, I think AI will do more harm than good. Um, and so I'm, I'm very interested in the audience's opinion of this question. Uh, so we just have a very simple agree or disagree. I think we'll give people one more moment and then maybe we can uh, go to the results. So we have 27% uh, agree with the statement, AI will do more harm than good, 73% uh, disagree. I realize that um, we might have a, um, a pro-technology uh, audience that maybe skews a little different than the rest of the population. Um, although I think this would be wonderful if this represented um, much of uh, Japan. Um, so 27% agree with the statement, 73% disagree. Go to this next slide um, where I wanna show you a poll um, that was taken of the same question um, in late 2018 by a Ford Global Survey. Um, and so the same question, I think AI will do more harm than good you'll see that most countries were above 50% or right around 50% thinking that AI would do more harm than good. Uh, India very high at about 61%. And China was really the lowest at, at 28%. Of course, um, with our results here, um, we can say uh, Japan now has uh, the lowest score. But this is a really important metric, I think, because public acceptance drives a lot of uh, public policy in these spaces. And you know, without uh, major public acceptance and support of new emerging technologies, 
it's very difficult for policymakers to move forward in these areas. So it's important that the public understand what is at stake and what the opportunities are around many emerging technologies. Now, when it comes to um, the different types of data policies that we see, there's really three different approaches and they really match up with this question of a precautionary approach or a innovationist approach. Um, so when it comes to data, you know, one approach that we see is a very nationalistic approach. It says that the goal of, um, you know, the goal of a country's policy around data should be to protect domestic sovereignty. Um, and so we often see a number of policies focused on making sure data is stored locally, um, whether it's to protect privacy, security, or the economy. Then we see an interventionist approach that says, unless other countries adopt our data policies, data must be stored locally. Um, and, you know, again, the goal here is to really impose domestic rules on other countries. And we kind of see this um, in Europe in the GDPR. And then you have the innovationist approach where the goal is really to foster digital free trade. Um, and we want to see data flowing globally. And that's where I think the US and Japan have really shared in common interest here um, because they both endorse this idea of the global free flow of data and have endorsed those types of policies. Now we've done a lot of work looking at where um, data blocking has occurred, which is I think one of the most serious barriers to this type of uh, innovation. And we see it happens everywhere, but we see it's very concentrated in certain areas where many types of data are being blocked. We also see that it applies to certain types of data more than others. Accounting tax and financial data seem to be targeted a lot, uh, as well as personal government uh, and other types of uh, data. And one of the reasons I think we end up with this type of policy is because there's misperceptions around this idea that data is the new oil. Um, that was written a lot um, in the early data when people were talking about the data economy. Um, and for some, you know, in some regard, it's a good analogy. Obviously, oil powered much of the Industrial Revolution uh, in the past. But right now, um, and right now, data is powering much of you know, the innovation we see. But there are key differences between oil and data that make this analogy start breaking down very quickly. Uh, for one, you know, data is non-rivalrous. Multiple companies can collect and use the same data simultaneously. Uh, in this way, I, I like the comparison that data is more like happiness. If I share with you, uh, there's more happiness in the world, not less. Uh, data is also non-fungible. You know, it's interchangeable and you can have, you, you know, substitutes. Um, and there's a near zero marginal cost here. Um, so bigger is often better. But the data's oil thinking often leads to peculiar policy proposals. Uh, so one, you know, it, it leads to this idea that we should be strictly limiting ownership. Uh, second, you know, it, it creates this idea that we should, um, you know, uh, have fair competition in these areas or control exports because we want to limit where the data goes. But if we think about, you know, data is actually just data, then we want to do things like increase access to data. We want to increase data quality. We want to accelerate the production and use of data. We want to increase data sharing. And we recognize that borders don't really matter when we're talking about data. We want to make sure it gets everywhere that it can. Um, and so I'll, I'll pretty much wrap up here. I, I just wanted to um, highlight, you know, this concept of um, data free flow with trust, which is something that uh, Japan really pioneered um, a few a few years ago um, and put this idea on the global stage. And you know what I, I think is really important about this concept is it didn't just promote the idea of the global free flow of data, but said we also need to make sure that data free flow with trust. And so thinking through that, um, you know, I'd suggest there's four principles that we can apply to this concept. Uh, one is that firms should be held accountable for managing the data they collect, regardless of where they store, process, or transfer the data. So here the idea is that, you know, it's about interoperability. It's not about adequacy standards. It's not about saying, you know, does the country directly adhere to what another country says? It's about can we work together? And this is where I think the cross-border privacy rules um, that are part of um, APEC, this is a great model for this. And this is a really important principle that I think other countries should look to. A second is that countries should put in place newer updated mechanisms to manage cross-border access to data to respond to cyber crime and, and cyber threats. This is where we have mutual legal assistance treaties that are very helpful. And this is where getting more countries to sign on to policies 
uh, like the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime are very useful. Um, third, you know, countries should think about how do we responsibly stop data flows of illegal content. Just because we're promoting the free flow of data, that doesn't mean we don't want to block things like um, music and video piracy or removing child sexual abuse material. We're taking down botnets. There still needs to be takedowns. It just needs to be appropriate and, and responsible for when it's uh, illegal content. And finally, you know, countries should support and not undermine encryption's role in securing data flows. This means you know, no backdoors um, in ensuring that you know, we actually have um, full global access to encryption. And again, this is something where I think Japan and the US can, can work together on policies uh, that work globally because we have so many of the leading countries, companies that are thinking about how do we export this technology globally. And so I'll stop there. Um, I'm also happy to talk about um, some of the emerging challenges in this space, um, in particular around misinformation and deep fakes. Um, but I want to pause my presentation and, and really move over to the questions because I'd love to get uh, your comments and insights. So thank you again. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Daniel. All right. So now we're going to move to the question and answer portion of today's program. So as a reminder, um, you will find the Q&A button on your screen and you may type your questions in there. Um, the questions can be anonymous as well. Um, so once questions are submitted, we can go ahead and move into answering those. Um, but I think while everyone's thinking, just to kick us off, I'm going to go ahead and ask a question um, concerning uh, a little bit towards this topic that you mentioned at the end. So kind of uh, more security, uh, looking at infrastructure, security and integrity. Um, are there threats or vulnerabilities um, and how do we mitigate them? What, what do you see from your perspective now? Yeah, certainly. So, I mean, we've seen with um, COVID um, really this acceleration of uh, bad actors taking advantage of this new situation to, um, to direct more attacks at uh, individuals, at, at companies, at government um, across the board. And, you know, I think there's there's a number of vulnerabilities they're trying to exploit. Um, one is people are working from home. Um, and so, you know, so many organizations focus on how do we build up perimeter security? How do we make sure that only trusted devices are on the network? And suddenly, you know, everyone's working from home. So you're working from, uh, you know, untrusted devices on the unsecured network um, where maybe children have access to it. And, you know, it's a very different threat environment. Um, another problem, of course, is that there's a lot of uncertainty out there and people are looking for information. They're downloading new apps and services. I saw this one app, for example, that uh, security researchers found, um, you know, it was delivering information about the spread of COVID. It was delivering the right information. It was the information from Johns Hopkins that a lot of people are looking at, but it also had uh, malware embedded in it. And it was actually with, it was state sponsored malware. And so, you know, you have these types of problems where people are, you know, downloading new things for the first time. They're trying to get information. There's confusion and uncertainty. They don't have access to their IT security staff. Um, and so there's so many threats that are out there. And we're seeing this in, in really key sectors. I mean, we saw the Zoom bombing that was happening with um, schools that were happening to other organizations. Um, part of this is, you know, we have inexperienced users that are using some of this technology for the first time. And so it's a real opportunity for um, both the private sector and government to, to step up to address these threats, uh, to work on, you know, really raising security across the board and recognizing that, um, you know, we're all better off when, when everyone's more secure. And, and we need these kind of global partnerships on addressing cybercrime because so much of this is cross-border. It doesn't do any country enough good to have a cybercrime task force if, you know, you identify the attack is coming from another country and, and you just hit a wall there. You need to have global partners in this area. And I think we've made a lot of progress in the past on areas like uh, spam. Uh, we've started working on things like malware and, and, and botnets for, you know, detecting. Um, but we still have, you know, uh, more progress that we need to make. And in particular, I just say, you know, since we started talking about AI, you know, this is an area where we're going to have, we're going to need to have a lot more focus. Um, one is using AI to address cybersecurity risks themselves. So using this to close workforce gaps and you know, respond faster to threats. Um, but it's also about looking at the cybersecurity risks that are inherent and, and novel as it relates to AI. So you know, before you were just attacking pretty much the, the code in the system, you were trying to you know, find a way around 
um, you know, a, a network protocol or you know, an encryption design. Um, but now you can attack the data, right? And this is a new type of attack. And there's new, there's other types of, you know, besides data poisoning, there's other types of attacks that you can make on sensors, on the learning systems. And these are areas where we need to have um, a lot of R&D. And this is something where I think there's opportunities for joint collaboration. Great, thanks for that, Daniel. Um, to get a sense of the audience's thoughts on this topic as well, we're gonna go ahead and launch our third poll um, on kind of understanding what you see as the, th the top threat to continued innovation. Um, so please go ahead and join us on your screens and share your thoughts there. Um, while you're taking this poll, we'll go ahead and move on. We're getting some questions now into the chat box. Um, so again, talking about AI and security, um, Daniel, do you have any idea how we should secure AI from cybercrime? Yeah, so I think there's, um, you know, there's, there's a few opportunities here. Um, you know, one is we're going to see, you know, as, as we have a number of automated systems, um, and to give a specific example, if you think about financial trading, right, this is an area where uh, you have very quick actors, you have humans, and now you have automated agents that are, you know, engaging in transactions. Um, we need to be able to um, think through how systems will work when we have both human humans and bots basically interacting in the same space. And how do you respond to those um, types of situations? Um, and, you know, some people have proposed various things like you should always be able to tell if something's a human or a bot. It's kind of, you know, a labeling type regime. Um, you know, there's, you know, we have things like CAPTCHAs right now that, you know, keep out bots from, you know, doing spam, uh, you know, we're going to have to think through, you know, some of those situations, but I think we have to be careful because what we, we don't want to do is we don't want to um, create rules that basically prevent us from actually benefiting from the technology. You know, bots are very useful, you know, as I gave Van this example of um, asking Alexa to renew a passport for you, you want to have those types of interactions. But I think we're going to have to think about how do we build a more trusted ecosystem to do that. One of the biggest challenges is identification. Um, right now, in, in most countries, there's not very good online authentication. So, you know, when I sign into this meeting, um, for example, I'm maybe using a password, um, but I didn't kind of legally prove my idea of who I was when I signed into this meeting. And that happens across every online service that we use, uh, pretty much. And so, you know, as, we, as we're moving forward in the space, we really think about how we build trust. And one of the ways to build trust is knowing who people are, who bots are, and so we need to think about this authentication uh, mechanisms that we're using. And that's an area where I think, again, private sector can do a lot. Private sector is doing a lot today in terms of creating single sign-on and federated identity systems. Um, but governments also have a, a huge role to play because it's ultimately um, the authority on, on legal identity, whether it's of a company or an individual. And so I think by um, working on some of those issues, we're gonna be able to create more trust in the system but we're going to need countries to be advancing that, that support, you know, some of our shared democratic principles like, uh, you know, free speech as well, because we also know we want to protect things like, um, you know, anonymous speech and um, the ability maybe to protest online or um, have different types of civic engagement or have a, a personal life and a, a, and a professional life. And so I think this is areas where, again, you know, there's going to be uh, really important global conversations where hopefully, you know, both US and Japan can be leading voices and, and can talk about the need for a multi-stakeholder open approach, just like we had with the internet. That's so true. Yeah, and that's, of course, what we're focused on here at the embassy as well. Um, so moving on to our next question, um, again with AI, where do you see uh, more immediate areas where AI is ready to add to productivity and enhancement of our livelihoods? That's a great question. I mean, I, I think some of this um, it's interesting because we're seeing AI embedded in, in many areas where we don't immediately recognize it, right? So, um, you know, when you use uh, Google Translate, um, you know, when you're traveling or, um, you know, to send emails with colleagues, when you, um, you know, that, that's machine learning, right? Um, when we get better weather predictions, you know, that's AI. And, and you're not necessarily seeing it labeled as this is AI. So much of it is just kind of baked into things. Um, you know, we're seeing this, of course, in, in things like, um, you know, movie recommendations um, directly to the consumer. But I think what's really powerful is 
you know, I, I've had the kind of privilege of serving on this um, committee that reviews a number of um, companies uh, that are submitting various ways they've, they've used data and AI each year um, to this contest. And one of the things I find most interesting is so many of the innovations are things that consumers will never really be aware of. So it, for example, it's a bank that's able to take in all of their um, you know, customer support emails and uh, you know, customer support uh, phone call logs um, and website traffic and put that into uh, analytics and figure out not only, you know, here's this customer segment that we weren't serving before, but here's what they need and here's this new product that we're able to provide them and to get the metrics six months later to see that they've really answered this unmet need. And so, you know, some of this, you know, it's, you get a credit card or, you know, a new financial service that's exactly what you needed. And you didn't realize that that was all AI in the background that, that led to that being developed. So I think, you know, we're of course going to see you know, the, the robots and the autonomous vehicles and, and drones and all these kind of really cool technologies uh, directly, but we also see so much of this innovation on the back end that we're not gonna recognize that that was AI, but it's really AI that, that led to those types of innovations. Great, thank you, that's a good point. <laughs> um, so moving on to our next question here. Uh, what is the area that Japan could contribute most in developing AI technology or robotics, in your opinion? Sure. So um, I mean, certainly, I think you know Japan's obviously been you know the global leader in robotics um, uh, forever. <laughs> it's just what everyone thinks of, um, and you know I think you know that what we're seeing with robotics, of course, is that you know robotics is autonomous vehicles, it's sidewalk delivery robots, it's robotics in the home, it's in the factory, right? It's in so many different places. It's, it's the caregivers in hospitals, it's doing the cleaning on planes now, and you know, will be a core part of how we respond to COVID and have public spaces that are safe. Um, there's just so many opportunities um, to do robotics, and of course, a lot of that's through machine learning. Um, and so, you know, there's areas, you know, I think where the U.S. is very strong. So the U.S. is very strong on uh, computer vision, for example, and computer vision and robotics, um, you know, go jointly together. Um, when you think about robotics as, you know, being some of the, the movement part, um, the sensing technology, um, the development of the sensors itself, the interpretation of those sensors. I mean, there's so much overlap in a lot of these areas. Um, you know, I think Japan has incredible strengths here and it can bring those strengths and apply it in many different sectors. Um, it's clearly an area where I think Japan will be exporting, um, you know, AI as a service globally, right? And so I think the opportunity here is to look for, you know, where are the areas where, you know, this type of AI, robotics um, in particular, is going to have the biggest impact. I mean, I do think the, the caregiving area, you know, just in healthcare in general, um, but also various types of caregiving will be uh, very big. Um, that's where you see a lot of countries spending a lot of resources. Um, you know, there's a lot of wealthy countries that are gonna have aging populations, uh, demographically, Japan included. And so I think this is just a huge opportunity. It's also an area where I think, um, you know, you see some of the different uh, approaches and, and you know, receptiveness to new technology. And it's one thing when you say, you know, people say they're worried about AI because they're worried about robots taking their jobs and they're seeing AI come in and, you know, um, assemble something that somebody used to do before um, or, you know, be engaged in some type of construction. Um, and, you know, I understand that, that concern. And of course, we know that, you know, history, we've, we've done a lot of work looking at this. We know that technological innovation benefits um, the economy overall. We, we still go to full employment. There's always new areas where people want to spend their money. So you, you retain full employment. That's not a, a, a real concern long-term for a national economy. It can be a short-term concern, particularly for particular jobs and professions. Um, but you know that concern looks very different um, and the, a very different approach to AI than people that are saying, you know, I, I see how this technology is going to make my life better when I'm 60, 70, 80 years old, when I'm reaching end of life, I see how this technology will make my parents' life better and make me have a better relationship uh, with my parents. I see how this will keep my children safe, 
um, you know, I think when we start seeing AI as that powerful enabling, um, you know, beneficial technology, that changes how we engage with it and it changes, you know, the types of policies that we pursue. So it's no longer, you know, this precautionary principle of how do we delay it because we're worried about our jobs to it's one about how do we get it sooner because we want to save lives and we want to improve quality of life. Yeah, I think that perspective is so valuable. And, you know, I think that relates to our next question here, kind of to, to draw on big picture uh, about AI. So on a scale of one to 10, how far would you say that AI has already accomplished in terms of its potential? One being it's only just begun, and then 10 being it's reached its full potential. What are your thoughts? Um, so, you know, I, I, I hate to make uh, long-term predictions because I, I recognize that nobody actually can do that. And, um, you know, I, I don't like to, I speak about things I don't know. Um, one thing I'd say is, you know, I, I've, I, there was a really interesting research paper that came out recently um, that was making the argument that without a significant increase in computing power, machine learning won't be able to do much more than it can do today in terms of capability. And, you know, I don't know if that article is true. People are, are, are still debating it. We're going to, you know, there's a lot of really interesting innovations around chips and um, quantum computing as well, where that might speed this up. Um, but even if that were true, even if you know, we say machine learning isn't going to be able to be significantly more capable than it is today, even taking what we're capable of doing right now, if we can just apply it across every sector of the economy, if we get to, you know, if, if we think about it in terms of electrification, um, you know, and, and when electrification began and you had to spread that across you know, entire nations, you know, we're maybe at 10% electrification, right? now or AIification right now. You know, we have so much more to go in terms of just adopting what the technology can do today. And so, you know, in terms of its potential, I'd say we have a long way to go. Um, but where that potential ends is uh, an open question still today. Great, thank you. I think that was pretty safe because it's hard to tell. It's hard to make a prediction now, so very true. Um, all right, so moving on a, a little bit, still on AI, but um, kind of a different facet here. Um, so what are your thoughts on facial recognition technology and how it should be regulated? Um, it has been banned in some states in the US and some companies like IBM and Microsoft um, have put a moratorium in place. Should Japanese companies follow suit? Um, so this is a, a, glad to get this question. I've done a lot of uh, work on facial recognition over the past um, year and a half, um, really looking at the technology and its capabilities. What we're seeing is that, um, first I'd say, uh, no state has actually banned it in the US. We've had some cities ban it, uh, but no state has banned it uh, statewide. Um, they have had some restrictions on government use of facial recognition technology statewide. Um, and we have, of course, seen some companies say they're gonna put a moratorium in place on selling it to law enforcement specifically, uh, but not using it overall. So I'd say a few things. One, um, you know, commercial use of facial recognition technology is here today, right? We're using it to unlock our phones, um, we're using it in airports, and we should continue to use it. It's a, uh, it's you know, it's part of um, uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, it's a good biometric. It's um, unlike fingerprints. It's contact contactless, which is great in an era of, of COVID and a pandemic. Um, so it's something we should be continuing to use. There are questions, of course, about you know public surveillance. Um, there's questions about uh, bias. We've looked at a lot of those questions, and what again, what I'd say is this is an area where we can put guardrails in place. You know, we want to put guardrails in place in terms of how law enforcement might collect information about people at protest, for example. Um, that's a very appropriate thing to do, regardless of whether facial recognition is being used or not. It's just a question of how should we surveil the public. Um, there should be guardrails in place in terms of are we using accurate technology that is accurate uh, across all populations. And here there's been a little bit of disinformation or, or misinformation or maybe just confusion about the technology um, because there's both facial recognition technology, which is technology that says uh, this photo matches another photo. And then there's technology that is um, facial characterization. So it might say uh, this person appears to be male or female, or this person appears to be um, a certain age, or this person has a beard or doesn't have a beard or is wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. Facial characterization technology um, has been proven to have uh, some significant uh, biases and effectiveness, particularly around gender and, and misgendering people. Um, that technology is different than facial recognition technology that's trying to match photos. 
Um, and what we've seen with facial recognition technology is that there's a wide variety of levels of accuracy uh, in the players and the, the different stakeholders out there. But the best performing uh, technologies, the best performing algorithm systems are not only vastly superior to human facial recognition, so when I try and recognize a face, they're also um, just incredibly accurate across all, all demographics. So above basically a 98 or 99 percent accuracy rate. Um, so when we see that high of accuracy rates, my takeaway is that we should continue to use the technology, but we should be, you know, really having public conversations and, you know, government being an early adopter to identify what are the accurate technologies um, and make sure we're using those and we're not using, you know, the poorly performing ones that do have high error rates. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Um, shifting to the global stage, um, what is your take on the recent conflict that seems to be increasing between the U.S. and its allies in China in respect to the AI domain? Um, the U.S. and Japan are considering banning TikTok, um, which is the biggest short video platform in China backed up by their algorithm. Are we headed to a more aggressive competitive era between the major global AI powers? So I you know, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about um, calls to ban TikTok um, based on the current evidence. It, you know, uh, certainly, um, you know, any call in this space you know, could be justified if we see, you know, if, if for example, um, it's proven that, you know, there's some kind of, um, you know, backdoor in the system that's collecting data surreptitiously or that the company is secretly sending uh, data to the Chinese government, which it said it has not, is not doing. Um, and my concern here is that, you know, we, we do want to see digital free trade, I think. Um, and when I say we, I mean uh, U.S. and Japan. This is a commitment that both countries have made in the past. And um, again, we, speaking for both uh, U.S. and Japan, we, we all benefit here uh, when our companies can export globally. And, you know, the concern about banning TikTok is that, you know, countries will start saying we're only going to allow uh, indigenous innovation. We're only going to allow domestic companies uh, to provide these types of services. I think that's what we saw when India banned TikTok. Um, India is obviously a large market um, and, you know, they are able to have uh, domestic competitors and, and banning TikTok obviously came, you know, as the countries were engaged in some other geopolitical conflicts there. Um, and so I think what's important is that, you know, instead of, instead of trying to block different technologies, um, which in the end, you know, you know, TikTok's probably not the technology that most businesses need to be highly competitive. I think it's a great platform. It's fun. I like using it. Um, it's not the one that, you know, is going to be the difference between, a, um, you know, a bank being successful or maybe not successful globally. But there are many other technologies um, that are going to be like that, where they're, you know, they want to have access to the best AI service. And if we start blocking technologies based on where they're based, that's going to exclude um, that's going to exclude companies from having access to, um, you know, the technology that will allow them to be most competitive. I think that will be a problem. So what we should be focused on instead is creating good global norms in this area and expectations around uh, security practices, around transparency, and around um, penalties that would emerge, you know, collectively if, con if a company is misrepresenting, you know, the types of, uh, you know, data practices that it's saying so that it wouldn't just be the US blocking TikTok if they were secretly sending data to China, um, but it would be all of US allies who would say, you know, that's, that's not right um, because we can't operate in a, a globally trusted environment if we have companies misrepresenting this information. Great, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, I know we are getting short on time this morning, so I'm going to um, go to our last question here. Um, and it actually relates to uh, our final poll that we would like to share with the audience. Um, so if you can go ahead and see that on your screen, um, looking at ways that the US and Japan can work together to promote innovation. Um, so we'll give you all a moment to, uh, to answer um, while I ask you this final question, Daniel. So looking forward, how do we you know, prepare ourselves or maybe catch up if we haven't been following this um, or educate others uh, to have the knowledge and skills needed to utilize and develop AI, you know, with these rapidly changing uh, technologies? Well, I think, um, so one of the um, interesting metrics we found when we did this recent study, 
uh, looking at the, the global AI leaders is that there were some significant differences in different countries in terms of um, not just who was adopting AI, you know, the, the number of um, companies that said they were starting to use AI, but there was a significant difference in terms of the number of companies that were beginning pilot projects in AI. And, you know, you have to start somewhere, right? And so in so many different organizations, um, really the, the question that they should be asking is, you know, what can we do over the next six months to at least start, you know, some kind of pilot of using AI? And AI, you know, it could be, you can think about all the different, you know, we have a report out about kind of all the different uh, functionalities that AI can provide. And you can start thinking about, well, you know, what are our goals and what are we trying to achieve? And, and where is there a good linkage with an AI tool? And, you know, it might be, you know, maybe applying some basic analytics. It might be using an existing tool. Um, it might be thinking, you know, more broadly about, you know, how this will affect um, a particular, um, you know, how it will affect competitors, how it will affect uh, customers, and then planning for that type of change. But really the key is to start thinking, what can you do now and, and start building those capabilities. You have to start somewhere. Um, and, you know, the countries I think are going to be most successful are those that have, you know, started to put in place pilot projects because they're the ones that are learning today what works and doesn't work. And then they're the ones that are really, uh, you know, driving the change in the future because they were first to market. I, I, I love the poll results here that seem to match up with that concept of, of partnering to support startups and entrepreneurs. Yeah, I'm glad we're all on the same page here. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are definitely some ways that we can take forward from this event um, to kind of grow our cooperation between our countries. Um, wonderful. So thank you so much, Daniel, for taking uh, some time out of your evening to share your thoughts and perspectives um, and expertise with us on these areas. We're going to go ahead and share just shortly. Uh, we have a survey that we would love to ask the audience members to take and participate in. It will come to you in the chat box and we'll be sharing um, a QR code on your screen momentarily. Um, there we go. Perfect. So I just wanted to say thank you again um, so much to Daniel for joining us today and to the ACCJ for partnering with us on this event. Um, we hope that you all remain uh, safe and healthy during these uncertain times. Um, and we thank you so much for taking time out of your morning to join us. Great, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me on. Thanks, Daniel.